learning from each other. You know, there's no room for lone rangers in the human rights movement, justice in anything we do. It's always that we're interconnected and we've become a community. And that's what's going to put Prop 34 over the top when California ends this. It's because like all these young volunteers are knocking on doors, going to talk to people, meeting people, talking to people. So let me tell you a little bit about my story. There are two parts to my story. One is the story that's in Dead Man Walking, which is how it all began. And then the other is this book called The Death of Innocence. I've accompanied six human beings to their deaths and witnessed as the government put them to death. And that's why I'm going to be doing this work until I die, because I cannot walk away from that knowing what I've witnessed. And each one of those men looked at my face when the state was killing them. And I said to them, you look at my face and I'll be the face of love. I'll be the face of Christ for those who are Christians. Most of them were guilty. And they had done unspeakable crimes. And I'm going to take you through it because one of the things we really have to deal with is our own outrage over the death of innocent people. And I just want to say flat out, when we hear about the death of an innocent person and we feel outrage over that death, that is a moral stance to take. We should be outraged over the death of innocent people. It's then what we do with the outrage. And we live in a quick society. You see it on the news. Terrible murder deserves a death penalty. And for a lot of people, that's the end of their reflection. And I'm convinced one of the things that's turning California around is look at all the discourse and all the discussion going on and people having a chance to learn about this. So the first man was Patrick Sonier. And I had awakened to the gospel that the gospel of Jesus is not just developing a polite society. I'm nice to my neighbors, they're nice to me. Every Thanksgiving we give canned goods to the poor so they can have a Thanksgiving basket and life goes on. The gospel of Jesus is really very radical. And it's to stand on the side of the people other people hate, the people who are oppressed. That's what the gospel is about. It took me a while to wake up to that. And we were saying earlier today, if you're sitting in here tonight, chances are you already are awake. You already have begun to look into these things and know the important things, and you're digging into it. You're meeting with other people. You're coming to hear talks. You're reading. To be awake is a precious gift of grace because it took me a long time to wake up. And But when I woke up, then the important thing when we wake up is to act. Because if consciousness and conscience are really close in human beings, and if we awaken to something and that it's wrong, and then we don't act, it can like increase our paralysis. It's dangerous to wake up and then not to act. And so we want in what we're learning tonight about the death penalty, that when something's wrong, when it's hurting our society, we have to do something. We have to act. We have to put our hands on the rope and begin to do something. I'm glad the League of Women Voters is here to register people to vote in case you're not registered to vote. And by the way, a judge in Pennsylvania just knocked down that ID register that you need to vote. We have a lot of people of color, and there are all these things coming down to make it hard for people to vote. So we got to be alert to that. And I love it. Thank you, League of Women Voters. You have been an educator with us for a long time in helping us to take those steps. So what happened is I moved into the St. Thomas Housing Projects and lived among African-American people in New Orleans. Now you gotta know, I grew up in the Jim Crow days. My daddy was a successful lawyer in Baton Rouge. And the only way I knew black people was as our servants. You know, Ethel worked in the house with Mama, and Jesse worked in the yard. And I didn't even know their last names. And at Sacred Heart Church, black people had to sit over in a special place. Black kids couldn't make their first Holy Communion, the body of Christ, we all won with the white kids. 
never questioned it. And that's what culture does. Culture, it's like we in a little tidal pool. We swim around with fish just like us. That's just the way we do things here. Yeah, these people do these terrible crimes, they deserve to die. Are they going to get out and they're going to kill somebody else? Or you put them in prison, they're going to kill a guard. And hey, I ain't paying all my tax money to keep somebody in prison the rest of their life. Use the money for a few chemicals and put them away. We'll save a lot of money. I don't want to be supporting that. They don't know Busca about how this money thing works. Until, till we learn, till we wake up, till we get educated. And African American people became my teachers. They taught me about the whole other side of life that I didn't know as a privileged, resourced, cushioned, looking like I'm seemingly virtuous. No comments from you. <laughs> but I, I, when I saw the kids coming into the adult learning center, I'd gone to a great high school, St. Joseph Academy. I knew how to do public speaking. By the time I was a junior in high school, they developed my gifts. I knew who I was. That's a great thing about education. You learn who you are and what your gifts are, and then you feel the agency and the power to be able to make changes in things. That's what education's all about. Like, hey, I'm here. These young people working on this, they know they're here, and they're already working for change. It's part of what education does for us. And here are kids coming in who had gone to the public school, got as far as 11th grade, give them a just to see what the reading level is, and they couldn't read if they're a great reader. They're in a public school, they're gonna graduate in a year, and they can't read. And I'm thinking of St. Joseph Academy, I'm thinking of our debate team, I'm thinking of public speaking, I'm thinking of our glee club. David, I love music too. It's just like singing, and music does something for your soul. It's just part of you. And so I went, well, I never knew all this was going. It's like a little girl one time I wrote this essay called The Poor Family. Once it was a very poor family. The mother was poor, the father was poor, the children were poor, the butler was poor, the chauffeur was poor. <laughs> I mean, it's a very poor family. And I could have written the blooming essay before I lived at St. Thomas. And it's while I was there one day coming out of the adult learning center, a friend who worked in a prison coalition office, what do I know about prisons in Louisiana? What do I know about incarceration in Louisiana? Not very much, except when I went to the Girl Scout Camp, Camp Meridale was right across from the Louisiana Penitentiary down the road, and we all in our cabin at night saying, ooh, them convicts gonna get out and they gonna come get us. <laughs> but those were convicts, and that's an Angola. I don't know my whole life is gonna be going down that road to Angola, and my life's gonna be turned around. Because coming out of the Adult Learning Center, there's a friend working in the Louisiana Prison Coalition office who meets me, has a clipboard, it's very casual, and says, he says, Alan, you want to be a pen pal? Somebody on death row? And see, I was beginning to learn about all the justice issues. I was beginning to learn about police brutality. I was beginning to learn about voter. I was beginning to learn about housing tenants and how you have rights as housing tenants. I began to learn about everything because I was open and ready. And I said, yeah, I could be a pen pal with somebody on death row. I mean, I, I got my master's, you know, in English and all. I, I could write some nice letters, you know. But here was the thing. Here was the thing. Whatever you think about God or, or non-God or whatever, however you deal with the sacred and the holy, I think God's sneaky. I think God's sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. Because what happened is, he says, and I said, yeah. I'll write some letters. Who's the guy? Patrick Sonier, addressing an envelope like I had never addressed in my life. Death wrote is the part of the address, the pressing to read your bloom mail. I wrote the man a letter. I never dreamed they were going to kill him. Because you see, there'd been this unofficial moratorium on the death penalty. We hadn't killed anybody in Louisiana in 20 years. This is the early 80s. I think I would be writing letters. I wrote. And you know what the problem was? This was the big problem. He wrote back. <laughs> and there was a connection between two human beings. And the connection's everything. One time William Faulkner, the writer, was doing a class on writing, and he walked up to the, to the uh, blackboard and just wrote two words, only connect. And the reason we have the death penalty